welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 118. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Today, our featured guest is Uriel Kame, a nutrition, fitness, and fat loss expert. He's a two-time New York Times bestselling author of the books, The All-Day Energy Diet, which we focus on on today's interview, and The All-Day Fat-Burning Diet. He's a former professional soccer player turned health crusader. He helps people achieve breakthrough results when it comes to having more energy and losing weight, even if you feel like you've tried everything else out there. You're in for a real treat. This was a great chat we had with Yuri. Now I'm going to get into an iTunes review and share it with you guys. And this one is by Says1905 from Australia, a five-star review. And the title is, You Guys Help Me Through My Depression. Sarah writes, Hey guys, my name is Sarah and I'm from Australia. I've been listening to your podcast for the last few months and I just want to say a massive thank you. I've been in a dark place for quite some time and listening to your podcast has helped me so much. I've listened to every one of your podcasts in a few short months and after much time off work, I'm finally back in reality and feeling so much better. I had your podcast to look forward to each day and it got me up, dressed and out walking each day. I'm studying nutrition and I've found my motivation again and I'm so thankful. Keep them coming. Awesome stuff, X Sarah, peace sign. Thank you so much, Sarah. These kind words mean so much to us, and we're so happy to hear you've had this miraculous health breakthrough. We wish you all the continued success with your health, and again, a big thank you. For those of you that haven't taken the time to leave us an iTunes review, take a minute, please go and do so. It helps give us that boost in iTunes, really easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash iTunes, and Marnie and I read each and every one. We thank you ahead of time. So now I'm going to give a shout out to one of our amazing sponsors, Sun Warrior. And since today's topic is all about energy, I'm going to give you guys an idea to make an energizing smoothie. And that means I'm going to highlight Sun Warrior's chocolate protein. So whether it's the Warrior Blend or the Classic Plus chocolate, go for chocolate, double it up with extra cacao. That's what I do. I put an extra tablespoon, sometimes two, of cacao into my chocolate smoothie. I'll mix that with maybe a banana, maybe some avocado, add some coconut milk in, almond butter, some greens maybe. So a really nourishing chocolate smoothie. This could be breakfast. This could be a mid-afternoon snack, post-workout, anytime that you need that extra little boost, get it from a chocolate smoothie. You are going to love it. And to get your hands on the chocolate protein powder or any other Sun Warrior products, You get a 10% discount as a listener of our show. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And for listeners in the US and Canada, if you spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. Amazing products, really great deal. Hit pause and go and take advantage right now. And now a shout out to our other amazing show sponsor, Raw Elements. Again, I'm going to give you guys some ideas on how to make really nourishing, energizing beverages without any caffeine. So if you are giving up coffee or you don't drink coffee and you need something else and you still want to get that awesome energy, what you can get from Raw Elements is something called Dandy Blend. And this is a dandelion base of a beverage or a drink that you can mix into water, hot or cold, and it tastes like coffee and you do not get that caffeine hit. It's uh, pretty grounding, really nourishing, and you can have it straight up with water. Or what I like to do is make a little bit of an elixir and I'll add in some cordyceps from Four Sigmatic and blend that into the base with some water and dandy blend. And then you're getting this awesome mushroom dandy blend concoction. And both of those can be found at Raw Elements. And then what you can do to sweeten it a little bit is put in some Lakanto, which is monk fruit sweetener. And those three ingredients with water or coconut milk or cashew milk, whatever nut milk you like, you've got a morning coffee, hot or cold, however you like it. It's delicious. Another quick option is to get your greens in. So vitamin oil greens is a really great way to get your energy in first thing in the morning. Just mix in some vitamin oil greens with some water or coconut water. Drink that back before you go and work out and you've got energy all day long. All these amazing superfoods can be found over on the Raw Elements website. And as listeners of the show, you guys get 10% off all your Raw Elements purchases. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. And when you get to the spot in your checkout where you can put in a coupon code, put in T-U-H-P. So that'll give you your 10% off. And for listeners in the US and Canada, bundle that order together. If you spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. 
So again, hit pause, go get some of these great superfoods, and uh, you guys are going to be happy you did. So now back to Yuri and some of the things we talk about on today's show. We get into wheat, sugar, and caffeine and how each of these three depletes our energy. Even though you might be thinking caffeine, that usually gives me a boost, but Yuri's going to break that down for us. We talk about acid versus alkaline blood depending on the foods we eat and how we want to aim for alkaline. That's the healthy state. Yuri shares his morning and nighttime routines in detail, which is super interesting. We get into the adrenal glands, how they become depleted, and once you get to that depleted state, how you rebuild them. So much great stuff on getting your energy back. Who doesn't want more energy? This is a great show. You're going to get tons out of it. So without further ado, here we go with Yuri Elkame. Hello, Yuri, and welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jesse. How are you doing? Excellent. We're excited to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here too. Yeah, and just curious, what have you done today to uh, get yourself energized for the day? Well, I walked my kids to school, then I took my dogs for a walk, and then I was supposed to play tennis. Uh, I got to the tennis course, and there was this round robin going on, so couldn't play there. Then my buddy and I went to another tennis club to see if we can get courts there, but there was they were fully booked, so that was unfortunate because I love playing tennis. So. Um, yeah, it's been a good active morning. Uh, I would have loved to have played some tennis, but otherwise it just gave me a bit more time to do some work. So it was good. Right on. Yeah. And Yuri, where I want to start this is with your story. Let's, let's go way back to when you had your wake up call back in your teens and your health made a turn for the worst. You had eczema on your hands, asthma, your energy was plummeting and, and you had alopecia. So a whole bunch of stuff started to fail you with your health. Let's go back there and, and set the scene by talking about that time. Yeah, so I was um, I, w- I was a fit adolescent because uh, I played soccer uh, at a very high level, so I was training and playing all the time, and I think that masked a lot of the stuff that was going on. So I was I was fit, but I wasn't healthy, and I, I see that a lot with like runners, for instance, or like a lot of like ultra distance type of people. But nonetheless, I was you know unconscious of of really health. I didn't really understand. Uh, much about health at the time other than, you know, just being active. So I was eating a lot of garbage foods for about 15 years and I thought I could just like burn it off just through exercise. Not that weight was a concern, but I I, I would go to like McDonald's before a soccer game type of stuff, right? So I didn't realize that having really bad eczema, really bad asthma, very low energy, uh, digestive issues. I had like, I didn't really clue into any of that stuff. I was just like, uh, you know, it's, I don't know. It's maybe whatever, whatever the reason is for that. Unfortunately, when I was 17 in my senior year of high school, all of that started to culminate and I started to lose my hair and I basically lost all of my hair to this autoimmune condition called alopecia within six weeks. So eyebrows, eyelashes, like everything. And that was a bit of a wake up call because I was like, okay, well, maybe I should look into this. And uh, not surprisingly, the medical community and medical doctors had really no solutions other than injecting my head with cortisone. And I said, uh, no, that's that's not going to happen. So I went on this kind of on and off journey for about eight years to figure out why this is, why this had happened. Went to school to study kinesiology and didn't really get the answers there. Not that I was really actively pursuing the answers every single day, but it was kind of on the back of my mind. So um, when I finished school, I was able to play soccer professionally for a number of years. So I did that. And then I got to the point where I said, you know what? This is not what I want to do with my life. So I retired when I was 24, came back to Toronto. And uh, through a series of events, I actually ended up going into school for holistic nutrition. And that's when the light bulbs went off for me. So at that time, I was a little bit more conscious of the fact that, okay, like maybe I can like get to the root of what had happened. So I started asking my professors who are naturopathic doctors and, and you know, natural healers. I asked them, you know, do you think that this hair loss could be related to my diet? And they're like, well, of course it is. We, we see it every day. And I was like, what? Like what? I mean, eight years and no one's told me this. So I was all of a sudden had this kind of glimmer of hope and it was pretty amazing. Cleaned up my diets, learned about the fact that my body was pretty much a toxic wasteland from years of dietary abuse. And within the space of a couple of weeks, my hair started growing back again. My eczema and asthma basically disappeared. And within about two days, my energy was higher than it had ever been in my life. And that was the big like wake up call for me it was like, hold on, I've never felt this, this energized ever in my life. I was sleeping in my teens and early 20s, 
in on a daily basis anywhere from 10 to 12 hours between nighttime and naps. And now I was like jumping out of bed with seven hours of sleep and like all day energy long, all day energy, pretty much title of my book, which is funny. Uh, but, you know, having energy all day long without, you know, caffeine or sugar and stuff like that. And it was, it was just such a big wake up call for me. And I was like, you know what, there's, if I didn't know this stuff, considering the fact that I was very active, had gone to school at one of the top universities in the world for, you know, health and, and performance, there must be billions of people who don't know this stuff. And I, at that moment, I started to dedicate a large part of what I was doing to kind of sharing this message about what I was learning and, and really just kind of distilling it down for the everyday person to understand. So that's kind of the, the impetus of how kind of my initial health issues, you know, morphed into to what I do now. And it's, it's been a, an amazing journey. And you brought up your book, The All Day Energy Diet, which is an awesome book, very comprehensive with so much awesome information. And we're going to get into some of that today. But just going back to your story, what do you think were some of the foods and nutrients that really kick-started your, your energy and your overall well-being that you noticed the difference within a couple of days? The biggest thing, hands down, was... I'm not even going to talk about the stuff I stopped eating. I was just think about all the junk. I just stopped eating that. And... The biggest, I guess, addition to my diet was greens. So alkalinity, chlorophyll, um, basically, you know, green vegetables. And and that was, you know, in the form of uh, smoothies, juices, salads. And, you know, previous to that, I never really ate vegetables that much. It was, you know, iceberg lettuce. That's kind of like the, the salad that I was eating as a youngster. And I never thought of things like kale, Swiss chard, spinach as, as anything remotely palatable. So it was... Starting to include stuff like that and starting to really feel the difference was incredible. Yuri, would you say it's a person's natural state to feel energized throughout the day? Because, I mean, even in the health world, coffee and bulletproof coffee is so prevalent and people are relying on caffeine to get through that afternoon slump. It just seems like the default these days with, again, everybody, including those in the health world, is low energy. So what would you say the default is? Should we wake up? springing out of bed or or what's the deal there? Well, I think everyone's slightly unique and there's a difference between like, you don't have to be like bouncing off the walls type of energized, but you definitely should not feel tired all day long. And what I realized is like, if you're chronically tired, that is a war. That's a big warning sign. That is like, like flashing lights, honking horns from your body. that something inside of you is not working properly or that your body is spending a lot of its energy on repair. And so if you're tired or relying on, like, you can't get your day started without coffee, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone sometimes because I'm like, that is ridiculous, you know? And like, and, and Dave Asprey's a buddy of mine, and, you know, I, I think Bulletproof is an amazing brand, and I think decaf is, is my preference to the caffeinated version, but I've been to health conferences where decaf, or sorry, where uh, Bulletproof was kind of the sponsor, and you have all these health experts who are... They're like zombies walking into the event without their coffee. And I'm like, guys, like, w- w- what's going on here? Like, you can't sit down in a conference without, without your coffee. And I'm thinking, I'm like, that, it just, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I think, I don't think most people have experienced how good they can feel without the caffeine, without the sugar, without all that stuff. And that's the issue is when you start to really purify your body with great, nutri- uh, with great nutrients, you've seen the light. And then whatever you do afterwards, you'll always have that memory of how good it felt. And then whether it's, you know, whether you want to pursue that is up to you. And a lot of people, you know, we go through journeys of, of less healthy eating and healthier eating and so forth. But once you've, once you've seen the light and you've experienced that, you always know that you can get back there. And I don't, I don't care how old you are, whether you're 20 or 80 or anywhere, anywhere in between, most people can feel a heck of a lot better than they think they can. And what would you say are some of the most common factors in the 21st century that are zapping people's energy? So going back to the food, lifestyle, what are the things that are really depleting us? Yeah, I mean, the big things are as a kind of a like an umbrella, I would say stress. Now I'm going to put everything else under that umbrella of stress and that, that it basically includes psychological stress. So emotional thoughts, all that kind of stuff, uh, physical stress in the form of the wrong type of exercise. 
Uh, and obviously, you've got environmental stress in the form of toxins and so forth. And then we've got food stress, right? So if you're eating the wrong foods, let's talk about like gluten, lots of sugar, inflammatory foods, those are all stressors on, on your body. And over time, they're going to wear things down. For instance, the adrenal glands, which are two little walnuts, uh, walnut-shaped glands on top of your kidneys, they are responsible for pretty much dealing with most stress that comes into your body. So they're going to start secreting um, epinephrine, which is adrenaline, and cortisol in response to this stress. And if this continues over time, then over time, those adrenals start to wear down. And really, when your adrenals burn out or get fatigued, that's when you can really no longer cope. Or you have a very tough time dealing with stress, very tough time dealing with emotional upset, very tough time uh, dealing with anything. And that's when you start to really just feel like like there's, there's just no escape. I mean, every day becomes drudgery. So I think, you know, stress is a very, very big problem. And again, it's not just like emotional, financial stress. I'm talking about all those different things that we just mentioned. And, and learning how to get your body to a place where it either, for instance, psychologically gives it a different meaning so it's not stressful. And when it comes to food, for instance, you're incorporating better foods. When it comes to exercise, you're exercising more intelligently. And environmentally, you're starting to look at, well, if I live in a toxic city where my surroundings are toxic, how can I make some better, better changes? Or how can I maybe cleanse some of the stuff that's been going on for a while? Um, all of that's going to make a huge difference because when your body, when your brain perceives that your body is stressed, the signal that is going to be sent from your brain is survival mode. Our brains are still working on the same operating system that we started with when we started uh, walking the earth. And we really haven't evolved biologically. So when our body is stressed, when our mind perceives that we are stressed, for instance, through high levels of cortisol and inflammatory cytokines, it says, slow down, hold on, conserve energy. And for a lot of people, that translates into fat storage and a host of other problems. So it really is, um, I believe, kind of like a, the big blanket. So stress in the form of those different elements is, is the big thing we want to take, uh, take care of. And I think most people know what it feels like to be stressed, you know, that, that anxiety, that, you know, that tenseness that carries on day in, day out. But are there tests that people can look to do? I know you've outlined a few in your book. So what can someone do to kind of get a baseline of where, where they're at? Yeah, I think, you know, like even without, I'll, I'll mention in, um, one of those tests, which is like totally cool and takes like 30 seconds in a second. But I think even before that is, is just kind of being aware of how you act in the world. So for instance, I've got three little boys and they're the ultimate barometer of like how I'm coping in this world because I can lose my mind very easily if there's a lot of stuff going on and I feel stressed out and they do something, I can snap. Whereas if I'm more chilled out and Zen and I've kind of taken care of my stuff, they can still be doing the same stuff, but I'm not reacting to that situation in the same way. I'm much more mindful of how I respond to that situation. So if you're losing your temper, if you get angry, if you're, you know, swearing and like, you know, giving people the middle finger while you're driving because they cut you off, these are all little signs that like just, you know, chill out a little bit because over time that's really not going to serve you. But if we're talking physiologically and we want to look at how stress is impacting, for instance, our adrenal glands, a really cool test. Um, all you're going to need is a flashlight. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a flashlight into a bathroom, close the door, make sure it's fully dark. And what happens in the dark is that your pupils will naturally dilate to try to get some light into your visual cortex. So in complete darkness, your pupils should be dilated. Now with the flashlight, what you're going to do is you're going to turn it on and shine it at your eye at a 45 degree angle. And what you're going to notice is that the pupil is going to constrict, right? It's going to become a lot smaller. And that's because there's this huge beam of light coming into your eye now. And now the, the pupil doesn't have to be dilated. Now that light is also a form of stress. So what the adrenal glands do is they pump out adrenaline or epinephrine to constrict the little muscles around your pupil. And that's why the pupil constricts. So this test basically is going to allow you to see how efficient your adrenal glands are at producing these important hormones. So if your pupil stays constricted for about 30 seconds, then you know your adrenal glands are in good function. However, if you notice your pupil starts to flicker after a few seconds, 
then that's a warning sign that eh, maybe things are not as as good as they should be down there. If within you know maybe a few seconds you go from full constriction to full dilation, then you know your adrenal glands are just you know they're basically worn out and they can't produce the epinephrine to get up to your eyes to constrict those muscles. So that's a quick thirty second test. It'll give you a really early you know quick indication as to maybe if you want to get this tested at some type of naturopathic clinic to really get a conclusive result, you know, through a salivary hormone test or whatnot, to really see what's going on with the adrenal glands. And that's important because the adrenals are also very closely linked to your thyroid. So if your thi- if your adrenals are messed up, your thyroid is probably going to be compromised as well. And if your adrenals are messed up, that's also kind of a, a result in some cases of gut issues. So nothing in the body ever happens independently of anything else. So it's a really interesting test to think about, okay, well, if this is going on, then there's probably some trickle-down effects somewhere else as well. Yeah, and often people don't make that connection that there's often a triad or more going on of a cascade in the body of all these things spiraling downhill. Yep. And I really want to kind of go back to the food and some of the foods that, you know, can stress out our body and that can zap our body of energy. And I know you alluded to a few of them, but I want to, I want to go into each one of these and I want to start with gluten and, and what that can do to our energy day in, day out. Yeah. So gluten is one of those things where, you know, we, everyone knows about it, you know, gluten free everywhere, but you know, some people are more sensitive than others. Some people have the HLA-DQ gene, which basically is um, a good indicator that they probably should never have gluten. But, you know, whether or not you're sensitive, I just tell people, listen, just assume you're sensitive because there's no benefit to having gluten in your diet. Now, I'm not 100% gluten-free. I would say I'm gluten light. I'm not, you know, crazy about this stuff. But gluten is one of those things that does a couple things. Um, First and foremost, it can irritate and inflame the gut. And there's a protein or the proteins in gluten start to activate the tight junctions or there's a protein in in the tight junctions of your gut, which can start to open up in the presence of gluten. And the problem with that is that in your gut, you have very small tight junctions or pores, if you will, that allow nutrients to come into your bloodstream. So nothing is considered inside your body until it is absorbed from the gut into the bloodstream. Normally, those should be, you know, nutrients, you know, trace minerals, amino acids, you know, glucose and stuff like that. The problem though is when you consume irritating foods like gluten, those pores become bigger. And now instead of just just allowing the good stuff in, now you're allowing some larger food proteins into the bloodstream and that starts to signal to the immune system that hold on, there's a foreign invader in here. This is not good. So the immune system starts to become hypersensitive. And that's the kind of the uh, the initial segue into things like food allergies and eventually into autoimmune disorders. So for me, I grew up eating bread, cheese, and cereal. Like that was, I could live on that stuff. And, you know, when you eat that for 15 years, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, your body is not going to respond very well. So that was one of the things that in my case happened. And, and so when you have that going on, not only is your gut being compromised, which can lead to, you know, a compromise in the adrenal glands and other things, but now your body is being subjected to this like internal battle all the time. So earlier I said that low energy is a warning sign that your body is having to really just kind of deal with stuff and repair stuff all the time. That is one of the ways where um, indirectly gluten can start to sap your energy because if you're constantly exposing your body to these uh, undesirable food proteins, your immune system is constantly on high alert. And so that's one of the ways. The other way is that gluten actually has a very similar protein makeup as your thyroid tissue. So we know that there's a very close correlation between gluten consumption and, for instance, Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune thyroiditis. So the thyroid, uh, the immune system basically attacks the thyroid tissue because over time it confuses something called molecular mimicry it thinks that your thyroid tissue is gluten because the protein structure is very similar. So instead of attacking gluten, it attacks your thyroid tissue and you start having thyroid issues. So if your thyroid gland becomes compromised, then we know that the thyroid is a master metabolism gland. And if it's sluggish and not working properly, you're going to have a very tough time losing weight. You're going to feel very tired. 
going to have cold hands and feet. You're going to have brittle fingers, brittle fingernails and hair. And it's just not a good thing. So those are a few ways that gluten can uh, negatively impact us. All right. And let's move into the next one here. Uh, Quote unquote food, sugar. And how does this go about depleting our energy? And does this go for food sources of sugar, things like honey, maple syrup, or are we just talking about refined sugar? Naturally, any food that's going to have a high dose of sugar is going to have this similar effect. So even if we're talking about maple syrup, which is for us Canadians awesome because it's, you know, homegrown and full of antioxidants, it's still, you know, high glucose. Things like honey, agave, they're higher in fructose and they need to be processed a little bit more through the liver to be converted into glucose. But you know, let, let's just assume that for them, for what we're talking about here, we're talking about added sugar, um, you know, sweeteners and foods and, you know, tablespoons of sugar added to stuff. Um, what happens with sugar is, is that it's essentially a stimulant. So it's very much like caffeine in a sense. It's going to jack you up in the sense that it's going to stimulate the adrenals to pump out adrenaline or epinephrine. And what that's going to do is that's going to break down stored sugar in the body. It's going to raise your blood sugar levels. And that's going to make you feel good initially. But what ends up happening is that when you are starting to mess around with your blood sugar levels, for instance, if so that's one way we can kind of mess around with our blood sugar. Um, but there's also the direct impact of eating the sugar, which directly gets absorbed as glucose into the blood and naturally raises your blood sugar. When that happens, your pancreas pumps out insulin. Insulin is a storage hormone. So it says, listen, there's too much sugar floating around in the blood. We need you to go out and get all this stuff out of the, out of the blood and store it in the muscles, liver, and fat. So insulin's pumped out and the more sugars in the blood, the more insulin goes out and it takes it out of the blood. But the problem is that when you have a high spike in blood sugar, you tend to have a huge drop off in blood sugar as well. So you go from this hyperglycemic state to a hypoglycemic state where you have very low blood sugar and then you you start feeling like a zombie. You start feeling spaced out and it's like you, you you go to Starbucks and have a muffin and bagel and coffee in the morning. You feel great for 30 minutes and then by the time you get to work, you're like, holy cow, I need another cup of coffee or something to kind of like get me back up because you're in this kind of sugar comatose. And if the fix to that is more sugar or more caffeine, then it's simply a Band-Aid because, again, the same thing happens an hour and a half later. You go back up and then back down, back up and back down. So it's this vicious roller coaster that over time can lead to serious problems in addition to obviously having you know energy issues because the more you start to mess around with your blood sugar, the more you start to mess around with insulin. And the more insulin you have circulating in your blood, that becomes a very problematic thing because not only are you storing more stuff potentially as fat, but high insulin is a, a strong marker to the body to produce higher inflammatory molecules, which is not good. And also over time, if your body is constantly subjected to insulin, it, like with any hormone, it will stop responding to it. And that becomes something called insulin resistance or eventually type 2 diabetes. So sugar is one of those things where we want to really keep at bay and especially sugar that's being added to foods uh, unnecessarily. Okay. And the last one I want to touch on here is caffeine. And let's talk about how this masks what's really going on inside our bodies. And it's basically a Band-Aid that over time is just going to make things worse. Yeah. So everything I just said about sugar applies to caffeine as well, specifically because caffeine prompts the adrenal glands to pump out epinephrine, which is going to signal to your cells that are storing sugar to break down that sugar into the blood. So it doesn't directly increase blood sugar like eating sugar does, but it does so indirectly through the adrenal glands. And again, constant stimulation of the adrenal glands over time, it's going to obviously initially you feel this high, but again, very quickly, you feel pretty crummy afterwards. And what's interesting is that there is um, a really interesting paper in 2012 in the Journal of um, Pharmaendocrinology or, or one of those pharmacology uh Uh, I can't remember the exact name of it, journals. But essentially what they showed is that caffeine really has, the the only benefit to caffeine is this kind of mental alertness or performance slight enhancement. But it tends to be most relevant in those who drink coffee most often. 
what they found is that between two groups, they had one group of, of coffee drinkers and a group of basically non-coffee drinkers, and they found that all the beneficial you know, things that people talk about with caffeine were non-existent in the non-coffee drinkers because instead of having the mental alertness and all that other stuff, what ended up happening was they felt so jittery that they couldn't even focus on anything. So in those who drink coffee routinely, coffee tends to have more of a benefit. Uh, for those who don't drink coffee and then drink coffee, they're going to feel pretty crummy. Now, I'm not saying that you should drink coffee even if you're existingly drinking coffee, but um, yeah, it's just not one of those things where you want to be consuming on a consistent basis because of what it can do to the adrenals, to the blood sugar, and the fact that, listen, it's 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 a mat, it's, it's a Band-Aid, it's a... Um, you know, it's so funny because people are are so addicted to their coffee that they'll go to amazing lengths to support their addiction. Like I've got people that are, you know, we'll post quite a bit of stuff on caffeine and adrenals and energy on our on our blog and Facebook page. And out of the blue, like these just, you know, regular people are quoting studies about the benefits of coffee. And I'm like, hold on, like you're that addicted that you went into PubMed, found a study on coffee <laughs> and brought it back here. And I'm like, listen, I'm not here to convince you. You can do whatever you want. I'm just, you know, stating the facts. So I'm not, I personally, full disclosure, I enjoy the taste of coffee. I drink it occasionally, but usually when I, well, when I do, it's always going to be decaf. Because if I do have caffeine, I'm going to be one of those, those jittery people who doesn't feel good. Are there other kinds of caffeine that you recommend in tea form or... No, no, caffeine is caffeine. Um, caffeine. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it it has the same effect in the body and obviously there's things like green tea, which are, you know, better for you and stuff. But again, if you're, if you're drinking green tea for the antioxidants, well, there's other ways you can get antioxidants than having to rely on green tea. But again, if you want to drink green tea, that's, that's totally up to you. So Yuri, if we burn the candle at both ends, we're stressing our body, we're consuming a lot of caffeine, our adrenals get burnt out. How do we go about starting to rebuild them? Are there supplements that we would consider or are there certain lifestyle habits that uh, you'd recommend? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, you have to focus on your diet. Everything in our body can heal itself. Our body knows how to heal itself. It just has to be given the right building blocks. So yes, you can take supplements like specific ap- like adaptogens or specific like vitamin C is very good for the adrenals. The B vitamins are very good. But again, those are supplements, Right. What we need to focus on is quality nutri- uh, nutrition, and really looking at the body as as this thing that requires nutrients. You know, most of us, most humans, require you know anywhere from they say five to ten servings of vegetables and fruit. Most of us are getting like one and a half based on you know most of the statistics. So if we simply focus on nothing else other than just add more good in, that is a massive step in the right direction for most people. Because when you eat, for instance more vegetables, you're simply getting more of these nutrients that your body simply doesn't get most often. And there's a very big difference between the nutrients in a food versus those same nutrients in a pill. And your body is always going to respond better to the nutrients found in food because it's in its whole form. It's in a form that is most relevant to other biological systems. And most Pills, supplements are using synthetic versions of a lot of these nutrients anyway. So for instance, like vitamin C is vitamin C, but when you supplement with vitamin C, most often it's in the form of ascorbic acid, which is only one component of the vitamin C complex. That's like saying that your roof is the same thing as your house. The roof is just one component of your house. So again, getting vitamin C from like cherries, the green vegetables, citrus fruit is going to be much more powerful than supplementing with it. So always focus on getting back to basics, eating cleaner foods. It's not rocket science. Like I, I don't have like this miracle food that you should be eating because in my mind, every single food is a superfood. Broccoli, kiwi, bananas, apples, blueberries. They have so many amazing phytonutrients that if you just eat enough of them over time, your body is going to transform. And I'm like you, Yuri, I'm a nutritionist who studied here in Toronto and my approach is always, always food first. You know, I, I know about supplements. I've been trained on them. I didn't do, you know, anything extracurricular on them, but I, I focus everything on, on food first and then you can always go from there. So I love that approach and I'm, I'm so behind that. And I know everyone's got 
you know, different dietary preferences and allergies and all that. But if we could give maybe a snapshot of what a day, uh, an energizing meals of the day that you can maybe outline from breakfast to dinner, just to kind of give an overview that maybe could accommodate most people. Could you, could you take us through that? I could. So I'm not paleo vegan, but I don't put a label on, on how I eat. I think it's very confining. So what I promote is basically eat more real food, more of those foods in plant-based form. And with that said, I have uh, ribs sitting in the slow cooker upstairs. So I'm not like fanatical about this stuff. But the whole idea is to get more plants into your body and of those, more of them in their fresh state. So unprocessed, uncooked. So essentially, um, a couple of things you can do. First thing in the morning, you want to, this is the time when you're, you have the most willpower, highest motivation. So use that to your advantage. Start off with something like really, you know, that's going to be really high quality nutrition. So maybe that is a green smoothie with a good amount of protein in it to keep you going for a couple hours, keep your blood sugar stable and, you know, fend off those cravings. Lunchtime, you can have like a veggie bowl. So maybe like some chickpeas and kale with some chopped up avocado and some other good stuff. There's obviously lots of great restaurants in Toronto that serve this stuff up, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, but at home, it doesn't take a lot of time to make this. And obviously, if you're working, you can do some really cool things. Like we have, uh, we produce a lot of cookbooks within our business. So a lot of the ones that we've, um, what we've realized is like a lot of people are like, well, these lunches are great, but how do I make that when I'm at work? So we've put together a lot of really cool ideas for people to take like great food with them at work. So for instance, like you can do mason jar salads. So you can make a salad, put it in a nice like liter size mason jar, keep the dressing on the side, take that with you to work, and that can be a really nice lunch. So that you've you've done it in the morning, it's in a mason jar, and you just add in the dressing when you're at work. Um, at home for dinner, this is the time when most people have the least amount of willpower because now their battery has been drained throughout the day of making decisions and resisting temptations. They're tired and they're stressed out a little bit. So if you have to make a decision in that state, that decision is most likely going to be a pretty poor one. So I advise as much as possible, do your decision making ahead of time, which means follow a meal plan or just say, listen, tomorrow for dinner, this is what we're going to have. And know that in advance have it you know, in your head or written down, have the ingredients on hand at home so that when you get home, you can make it and there's really little willpower involved so that you don't, you don't resort to getting takeout or, or stuff like that. Um, so again, at night, it could be, you know, for instance, for me, it might be a piece of salmon with a big salad. I, I basically you know, espouse having a big salad with pretty much all of your meals if you can, especially uh, at dinner time when you have time to sit down. You know, it could be a nice soup. It could be, there's so many amazing different things you can do. So it doesn't matter if, you know, if you're into, if you want to have some beef, whatever it is, chicken, or if you're vegetarian, there's, you know, some great things you can do with legumes. But the key is to focus on, you know, if you look at your plates, just try to, just try to envision three quarters of that plate being vegetable based. So ideally, you know, some steamed greens, maybe some quinoa, maybe some mashed sweet potato, um, a side salad, just, you know, keep things really simple and, you know, don't worry about, you know, oh my God, this isn't paleo or whatever it is. It's, it just becomes very, very, very confusing and very limiting, I find. So, you know, eat what you enjoy eating, ideally, you know, in a way that tastes good. So there's a lot of great recipes out there that, you know, make healthy food taste good and find, I would say, find a good rotation of foods that you enjoy that you can turn to on a regular basis because we tend to find, we tend to find that we rotate the same about five to seven meals. That seems to be our go-to. So if you can make five to seven meals your go-to and make those five or seven meals, you know, really healthy and great tasting, then that becomes your go-to thing where it's like, well, what do we have for dinner tonight? Oh, let's make that, you know, that health, healthy soup we had last week or this, you know, this raw pasta that we had, you know, a couple of days ago. Just have those go-to meals that you really enjoy so that you don't really have to think outside of the box all the time. And it's just, you know, really simple to prepare. Perfect. We're on the same page as you. And I'm curious on your thoughts on snacking. So what do you think about snacks during the day? And if you have suggestions of what people can snack on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think snacking is fine. Uh, I'm a huge believer in the power of fasting as well. So I think a lot of people have been conditioned to believe that they have to be eating all the time for whatever reason, like their metabolism is supposedly going to shut down or their blood sugar is going to go all over the place. 
Uh, but fasting has tremendous benefits. That there's really, you know, unless you have compromised adrenals and thyroid function, uh, fasting has unbelievable benefits for everybody. So if you don't go a couple hours without eating, you will be totally fine. If you go a day without e eating, you're going to be totally fine. You're going to give your body some tremendous time to heal itself, bring itself back into a more balanced state. It also helps with fat loss and you'll feel just tremendously mentally clear. If you want a snack, totally cool as well. So I basically tell people, listen, eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full. Do your best to listen to your body. If you're hungry, have a snack. If you're not hungry, don't have a snack. What, you know, what, what entails a snack? Well, I don't know. I mean, it could be leftovers from lunch. It could be leftovers from yesterday. It could be an apple. It could be some nuts. Um, ideally, it's not, you know, like muffins and donuts and stuff like that. But again, a, a snack doesn't have to be like a quote unquote formal snack. It could just be a bit of the food that you had yesterday that you're just heating up again and having a little bit of that. So uh, listen to your body. If you're hungry, have a little something. If you're not, that's totally cool as well. Yuri, in the book, you talk about acid versus alkaline blood and how the foods we eat are affecting this. Can you give us a little bit of a breakdown of how this works? Yeah, so essentially when you eat foods that contain more protein and phosphorus than the alkaline minerals, calcium, potassium, magnesium, you are essentially dumping more of an acidic residue in your, in your body and that trickles into your bloodstream. Um, so foods like that would be dairy, meat. So basically all animal products are, are very acidic. And then we start getting into more of the neutral foods, slightly acidic being like the nuts and some of the grains. The reason that's important to know is that your blood, the human body's blood needs to be slightly alkaline to function at its best. So what we want to do is we want to focus on getting more alkaline forming foods into our body. And it's pretty simple. Vegetables and fruit are the most alkaline forming. So Without obsessing about this stuff, again, just go back to your plate. If you have a plate of food and let's say you have a piece of steak as your, you know, your main protein, just make sure the rest of your plate is vegetables because that way you're going to balance out the acid with all that great alkalinity in the form of all those uh, minerals and nutrients that are going to leave more of a, an alkaline ash as it's called uh, once it's metabolized. So the, the, the importance of this is that acidosis in the body becomes very, very problematic from an energy perspective. Uh, 1931, Nobel Prize winning scientist Otto Warburg also discovered that cancer only grows in oxygen-deprived acidic environments where cells crave sugar as their supply for energy. So we want to be infusing our body with oxygen and alkalinity. And there tends to be more oxygen in environments where there is a higher degree of alkalinity as well. So when you're eating your greens, when you're eating your fruit, um, when you're eating these amazing foods, you're naturally giving your body everything it needs to function at its best. And that's basically the premise of, uh, of all that. Let's jump into exercising for energy. I know a lot of times out there, people are really pushing themselves in the gym or if they're out for runs and they're pushing themselves to the point where they feel really depleted afterwards. What's the secret to exercising and being in a state of feeling energized when you're done? Okay, so this is there's there's kind of two different courses here. When you exercise at a high intensity, you get that that like euphoric feeling. And that's that's great. And that's gonna, you know, energize you temporarily and you're gonna feel amazing. That's why it's awesome to start with with some type of activity in the morning. So you kind of ride that wave. Um, with that said, if you have like full bone, full blown adrenal fatigue where you're just like exhausted by shouting, for instance. That type of exercise is strongly discouraged because, again, that type of exercise is a huge form of stress in your body. And if your adrenals are depleted, you will feel physically and mentally exhausted if you do that. So let's assume that somebody has adrenal fatigue and they're just exhausted all the time. That type of person wants to be doing things that are much lighter with more recovery time. So maybe it's a very light jog or it's a bike ride or it's a nice walk. Again, you should be getting your breath slightly huffing and puffing, but you don't want to be getting to the point where it's like a CrossFit workout or a Tough Mudder race where you're lying on the ground afterwards because you're exhausted. Um, that type of exercise has its place in very small amounts. And, you know, as a former pro soccer player, I can, I've seen it and I've experienced it firsthand that you can't maintain that level of intensity for very long. 
Uh, and we know that. I mean, most pro athletes don't last past 35 because of the wear and tear on their bodies of that day in and day out grind. It's, it's basically wear and tear. It's almost like driving your car a million miles. It's going to break down. So you want to be using, as let's just assume we're talking to most people who are generally healthy, who don't have full-blown adrenal fatigue. The exercise that I would prescribe is short bouts. So I'm talking like 20 minutes full body, heavy weights, if you're using weights or body weight is fine too. And you want to be getting a lot of movements. So a lot of, um, basically you're training movements, not muscles. So you're compounding exercises back and forth. So you're not wasting time and rest and you're getting your entire body involved. When you do that type of exercise, you burn more fat, you get a cardiovascular workout as well because your heart is pumping, you're sweating it out, which is a good sign as well. And when you do this type of stuff, you don't have to be working out seven days a week. So you're looking at like three workouts a week, 20 to 30 minutes at the most, and you're getting your muscles going, you're stressing your muscles. And I'm talking about choosing weights that only allow, let's say, six to eight repetitions. And this is especially important for women who tend to focus on light, uh, light weights, high repetitions, because they think that's the way to tone. But the reality is you need to be focusing on heavy weights, very low repetitions, because at that repetition range, you're not stimulating muscle growth, but you are stimulating strength and power, which are very important for everyday function. Lifting your kids, you know, walking upstairs, getting off the, you know, getting off a chair, and uh, and as well as you know, sport performance. So that is generally what I'd recommend for you know the healthiest person and the person who's completely depleted and adrenal fatigued. You should still be doing some type of strength training, but not to the same intensity. Give yourself plenty of recovery. And the cardio uh, would be very light. So some walking, some very light jogging. Um, and again, volume needs to be on the low side. So, you know, a few times a week. And uh, you definitely don't want to be drained after that workout. I'm a big fan of body weight. And what I love about it too is that it's low maintenance and you can do it at home. And yep. I know you've outlined a very quick, a couple of quick little workouts in the book that uh, someone could just do beside their bed or in their living room. Do you want to just maybe go through one of those little routines? Yeah, um, I can't remember the exact routine, but I'll give you um, an example, and maybe it's maybe it'll be the same one. I don't know. So what you could do is, and this is actually like body weight is actually for most people a great place to start, and most people don't even use their body efficiently. So when they start lifting weights, they're not even doing it properly. So most people, even if you're advanced, get tremendous benefit from body weight training if it's done well. So for instance, you could do, let's take a simple circuit. So let's take 30 seconds of work and 30 seconds of rest. So we'll start off with an exercise, uh, body weight squat. So basically just squatting down as if you're sitting back into a chair, 30 seconds of work, take 30 seconds off when you're done. Next, we'd move into push-ups. Again, there's, there's nuances within these exercises to make them more challenging or not. So depending on your level, you can do different things, but 30 seconds of push-ups, then we take 30 seconds off. Then we could do 30 seconds of lunges where you'd step back, drop down into a lunge, step back to standing, opposite foot back, same thing, and repeat for 30 seconds. Then we could do uh, a plank, which is a great core exercise. Hold that. You're basically, your body is on your forearms and toes in a straight line. Hold that for 30 seconds, keeping your core braced and engaged. Take 30 seconds off. And that's four exercises. You could repeat that three times around, and that might take you 10 minutes. And again, that's not necessarily a grueling workout for a lot of people who might be a bit more advanced, but for the average person who just wants to get things going, uh, it's just a great starting point. So kind of th there's so many different ways to do your know, workouts, different protocols, different exercises, different tempos, but that's just a simple example of something you can do in your living room. That's great. And Yuri, in the beginning, we talked about stress in a really general sense. We talked about it as anything that's robbing us of energy, but I want to jump in and, and focus in on psychological stress specifically and being in the 21st century this go 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 mentality that most of us are faced with a lot of us have a lot of day-to-day -day stress what are some of the things you personally do or you recommend with your clients to help ease this stress yeah so first and foremost i think it's a mindset stress is nothing more than your the meaning you give to a particular situation so if you just have the mindset or the belief that everything is working out for you, that naturally changes every event that you experience. 
oh, your car got hit by someone else's car. Well, maybe that was everything's working out for you. For some reason, you just have to find the meaning in that. You're stuck in traffic. Well, find the meaning, the benefit in that. You know, whatever the situation is, just think about everything is always working out for you. And if you can live life with that mantra, that mantra, it becomes a lot more empowering. You become a victor instead of a victim. Life is happening for you instead of to you. And when you have that simple shift, things that naturally would stress you out tend not to stress you out as much. Then we can look at simple things like meditation, which is massively important. Meditation, I find, is like, you know, if you've got a pot of boiling water on the, uh, on the stove um, and you have a lid on it, a lot of people go through their days like that, where there's just one thing ready, they're one thing away from having that lid blow off the pot. What I find meditation does is that it turns down the temperature and lowers that boiling of the water to a light simmer. So you're naturally able to deal with stuff in life a lot more effectively and you don't blow your lid as much as you would otherwise. And meditation has, you know, well-documented benefits like for everything pretty much. So I would say, you know, if you can meditate and meditation is literally just like closing your eyes and focusing on your breathing, trying to clear your mind so you have just this kind of space of vacancy and, you know, anywhere from like five to 20 minutes a day. Some people do it a lot longer, but even just a couple minutes can make a big difference, especially when you're in the midst of something hectic. Very, very powerful. Spending more time in nature is huge. So get outdoors, forests, walk by the beach, connect with the earth. You know, if you live in a city, um, like we live in Toronto, there's tons of amazing green parkland here. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to have that. So, you know, get outdoors and spend more time in nature. You feel better than if you're walking down in the downtown core surrounded by buildings. You know, another thing is just uh, gratitude or appreciation, like really just express appreciation for what you have in your life. You know, we tend to take for granted pretty much everything that we have or experience. So just, you know, take a moment to really appreciate the small things, you know, being able to walk outside without having to worry about, you know, fighter jets dropping bombs on you, uh, stuff like that. Like, you know, there's a lot of little things that we can be grateful for and, and to truly feel that appreciation makes a huge difference. You can't be stressed when you're in a state of gratitude. So, so many things to be grateful for, and it's just a matter of shifting your focus. Those are all great. And I want to talk a little bit about sleep and your nighttime routine and how we can optimize our sleep so that we're waking up the next day feeling as energized as possible. Yeah. It's funny. I was talking with my brother about this because he's looking for a new mattress or something, yet he sleeps in a bedroom with a 40 inch TV. I'm like, dude, it's so funny. Don't you find that? Like so, so many people stress about their mattress yet they'll fall asleep watching TV. That's like, it's completely backwards. You could sleep on the floor if you really wanted to, uh, as long as you kind of maintain a good bedtime routine and, and by bedtime routine or sleep hygiene, the most important thing you can do, and this will probably have the most far reaching effects and benefits on all aspects of your health is to go to bed and wake up at the same time every single day. And the reason that's important is that's going to help reset your biorhythms, your circadian rhythm, your circadian clock to a very consistent schedule. And that's going to impact in a positive way all of the hormones in your body. That's one of the most powerful things you can do from an energy perspective, rejuvenation perspective, a fat loss perspective. Go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. If you can go to bed before 1030, it's even better because that allows your body to spend more time in deep sleep where your body releases growth hormone and it actually repairs your body. And so that's massively important. So that's the first thing. Second is you want to sleep in essentially a cold tomb. So pitch black, no lights, none of that stuff. And your room should be slightly cool. So in Celsius, that might be, well, I don't even know what it would be, but in Fahrenheit, I think it's about 66 to 70-ish Fahrenheit seems to be the, the sweet spot. Um, so whatever that is in Celsius, maybe that's 20, 21, I'm not sure, maybe even less. So that's, you know, a cool temperature is really important because coolness or a lower body temperature actually signals to your brain that it's bedtime. And actually, it's a more important signal to your brain in terms of sleep than light and dark is. So it's really powerful. So we want a consistent sleep and wake schedule, darkness in the room, relatively cool temperature. And uh, the final one actually is before all that is to shut off your electronics. Give yourself a good 
hour before going to bed to shut off your phones or don't look at them, uh, TVs, computers, because all of that blue light emitting stuff is going to signal to your brain that it's wake up time, not go to sleep time. And if you have to be on that stuff, then uh, use a simple app like Flux on your computer, which dims the light. It takes away the blue light. And the good thing about the new iPhone is it actually has a natural blue light dimmer, which is like the best feature any iPhone has ever developed. Like for me, that was that was a huge, uh, nice update they had to their operating system. So yeah, or you can wear blue blocker sunglasses like some people do, but I don't think you need to go to that extent. You'll look a bit like a psycho in your own house. So those are those are a few things that will really help you sleep better. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that new software update as well. And it was unfortunate before because Apple kind of, decides what can and can't go into the app store and they didn't allow flux on the phone. So that was huge when that release came out. Yeah, big time. So Yuri, let's go other end of the spectrum and let's get into your personal morning routine. So you mentioned getting up at the same time every morning and going to bed at the same time. So when you get up at that same time in the morning, what is the first, say, 60 minutes of your day look like? Well, uh, my morning routine has, has shifted a little bit uh, or become non-existent because I took two months off in the summer and it was, it was just like vacation for me. So my, my normal routine in the morning is I get up at about five o'clock and the first thing I do is I'll spend about 10 to 15 minutes doing some type of dynamic mobility work or yoga. So I'm stretching my body, moving, getting every kind of like lubricating my joints, getting everything nice and fluid. Then I will spend the next five to 10 minutes doing some type of meditation. So it might be just some deep breathing, some visualization, and then I'll get into my most important work for the day. So I spend the next 90 minutes on the most important thing I need to accomplish that day. And during that time, I'm drinking water or you know greens or whatever it is. So I'm hydrating my body in the process. And then my kids are up by about seven. So I spend you know the next two hours with them, getting their lunches ready, making them breakfast, and then I'm, um, you know, out the door before but 8.30, dropping them off at school. And that's typically how the mornings work. So pretty straightforward. Awesome. Sounds like a good start to the day. Yeah. So what we're going to do now, Yuri, is take you through a rapid fire question round and ask you a series of questions that you can just answer quickly what comes to mind. Sound good? Bring it on. Awesome. So if there was someone that you could go to lunch with, alive or dead, that you look up to, you respect, who would it be? Um, I'd say Tony Robbins. Yeah. Okay. And what is your greatest fear? Greatest fear is not accomplishing all the goals that I have for myself. What is your specialty in the kitchen? Specialty in the kitchen? Well, uh, this is definitely, uh, I don't know if it's a good one, but it's uh, gluten-free crepes. They're awesome. And Yuri, your favorite vacation spot? Well, I'm going to say just based on the frequency that I've been there, Zihuatanejo, which is a little fishing village on the Pacific side of Mexico. It's really awesome. What makes you feel most alive? Playing tennis. And last one, Yuri. What lesson has taken you the longest to learn? Patience. Okay, great answers. And in wrapping up, Yuri, one question we ask all the guests is, what is one thing we can take away, apply right away after this interview? You've given so much great info, but just to distill things down, something we can apply right away to help us reach ultimate health. Just have one green juice or green smoothie per day. Just whatever, even if you're having McDonald's seven days a week, which I'm sure you're not if you're listening to this, but just add in one green juice or one green smoothie. It'll make a huge difference. Simple enough. Something we live by every day for sure. Awesome. So Yuri, where can everybody find you? You've got your book, The All Day Energy Diet. You've got other resources as well. Where can people connect? Yeah, the best place is um, our website, which is yurielkame.com. And I mean, we're publishing, you know, great stuff on there on a daily basis. I'm also on YouTube and Facebook as well. But um, I'd say our blog is a great, a great place for recipes, workout ideas, just overall health and fitness advice that's simple to understand without all the complexity. All right, Yuri, this has been great. Thank you so much. And listeners, be sure to check out the show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 118. We're going to put links to everything we discussed how you can connect with Yuri, a nice show summary. And uh, yeah, you guys will get a lot from that. Yuri, again, thank you. And uh, let's keep in touch. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jesse. Thank you, Marnie. You're so welcome. Thanks for being on the show today. Absolutely.
Love that amazing conversation with Yuri. We hope you guys got so much out of it. And to keep the conversation going, come on over to our group, ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash community. That is where we share lots of good things. And this week, I actually shared a picture of a morning elixir that Jesse and I are loving right now that is giving us incredible energy. So go find that post. There is a picture of a cup with a chocolate beverage in there and you will find the recipe in the comments. So head on over there. We'll let you in and we hope to see you soon. Let's keep that conversation going in between episodes. We'll see you over in the group. Have a great week, you guys. Talk soon.